of consulting firm, primarily supporting GCCs in their scalable engagement. That's where we've been working with a lot of manufacturing industries as well as like, you know, the consumer industries. And what we have seen in the last couple of years is that there has been a narrative change where like, you know, GCCs, GCCs were typically looked at as more of cost center or an opportunity to cost us. But what we are seeing more and more is that there is a perception change, there is a positioning change. We are talking, hearing about like newer topics in terms of process automation, RPAs, artificial intelligence, digital things. And to be frank, what we are seeing like you know more and more is on the manufacturing side, where we are seeing about like digital twins, industry 4.0, and a lot more of these topics. That's where our objective today is to hear out a lot more of these from the leaders here and get some insights. So probably I'll start with a set of questions. Um, my question is primarily to Bharat uh, We want to start with understanding how you are driving your data to your initiative. What are the initiatives? How are the data driving your data? Right, I'll probably go first. Um, so I'm from Western Digital. We make data storage devices and works 40% of the data resides on our devices. And why I'm coming this is because we do about 85 to 90 percent of the manufacturing in house, right from the front end wafer manufacturing until the back end assembly and test. Now, this happens in about 12 huge industrial size manufacturing facilities. Now, it's impossible to run this facility with the effectiveness unless you have or you're making data driven decisions. Um, so, probably, when you look at this, uh, the overarching goal for us is how do we really improve on the overall equipment effectiveness, the OE, right, which essentially tells us that now how good your utilization of the factory is. Um, if you look at, into it, uh, three aspects are the Number one, in terms of the availability, uh, making sure that the uh, the equipment, so the tools are all up most of the time. Um, you also look at the performance, uh, making sure that you are hitting all your throughputs targets, and making sure that there is no stoppages in all those. Uh, in, in your production line. And third is in terms of quality, right? Because uh, as a company, we want to make sure that uh, a consumer never faces a problem in terms of eating and writing the data. So quality is up to, up most important. So that really uh, talks about how do we reduce the recalls, how do we make sure that there are very less scrap coming out of your production. So, so in general, these are the three major, I would say, broad, uh, broad areas under the overarching capability of OE. That's what I measure and most of the decisions around that. Come on, your views. Yeah, uh, so hi everyone. Uh, I represent Carrier uh, Corporation and we are in the uh, HVAC and air conditioning industry. Uh, Carrier is a 100, 120 year old organization. Uh, the organization, uh, our founder, uh, has invented the air conditioning. That's how the the background and journey starts. Manufacturing is a very important aspect for us because um, we being the global uh, player uh, in this segment and with a strong market share. When it comes to manufacturing, definitely uh, with all these advancements what we had uh, in the last five years uh, with all this industrial uh, 4.0 and now we are looking at 5.0, uh, I think the basics uh, are coming as a part of playbook. What we uh, see in manufacturing through the preventive maintenance. So, there might be cases where, uh, you know, depending on the geography and the tech depth, you might not have that check. But what becomes advanced uh, story for us is how do you bring uh, the different stakeholders like your supply chain, finance, business, right, your order management team, your factory operations into a collaborative platform which is powered by data. So what happens is uh, once you are on the platform, your decision making happens fast. You are precise and accurate in your plan and you can drive more uh, action on the platforms. Today uh, we see that uh, in, um, the conversation that I had with a lot of uh, my peers, that's a big problem area right now which exists. So we are trying to solve that internally. How do we create that collaborative platform which is powered by data and bring the entire this group of stakeholders together who are aware and informed? That's one observation and initiative what we are sharing here. Understood. So, OE is a metric and collaborative platform is something which is a 
Now, following up on that, right, again, if you have seen, like, you know, some of the events and so on, a lot more on buzzwords, a lot more of, like, new technologies, the yeah, IoT, CAAs, and whatnot. But again, like you know, it's more for us from a services side to talk about these things. But from a practitioner's perspective, this may be a right? uh, like the What do you think, like you know, how do you want to evaluate these uh, new technologies? How do you operationalize it? How do you drive the whole change management? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about obviously manufacturing, we are a manufacturing company. Uh, but uh, more often than not these days, we say cars are nothing but four wheels that run on a software. I think uh, the manufacturing itself is uh, rapidly evolving. There's a lot of electrification that's happening. And uh, in any manufacturing organization, supply chain visibility becomes a uh, primary uh, requirement and po more so post COVID scenario because we've all seen how much supply chains have struggled during uh, uh, the pandemic time. Um, so like any other organization, at most of the manufacturing companies, if you look at it, I think almost, uh, you know, most of the services, at least 85% of them have already adopted AI, right? And uh, a, a big percentage of them um, are using already effectively, and they expect as high as 40% productivity to be driven out of uh, these technologies. So it's not a question anymore about do we adopt the technologies? It is definitely, I think we've all well passed that uh, questions. It is about uh, how do we adopt it and what are the use cases? And uh, you know, of course, now we talk about generative AI, but uh, AI has been around for uh, many, many uh, years. And uh, we've, uh, in general, we've used it in many use cases, scenarios. Things like risk scanning, uh, total vehicle quality uh, uh, checks, total vehicle inspection, because uh, uh, the cost of rework for a car like a Range Rover, uh, even if it is a small paint error, it can really cost us time and money. So, how do you use uh, the AI in uh, these kind of areas? So, there are various um, use cases that we used as part of our imagining strategy. Is it a fair summary to say that build a business case around that and go on for doctor? Absolutely. I think it is it's given. It is about uh, um, how do you want to value it and how soon, how fast do you want to adopt it. And what we are seeing is really just the tip of the iceberg with the journey I coming into play. Uh, the, the possibilities are going to be endless. But I think the whole question as organizations are facing is not about do we use it. But how do we ground them ethically in your organization policies? How do you, you know, make your organization philosophy ethics as a pillar for using these technologies? Actually, any thoughts there? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and, uh, I can add on to that. So there are two lens. One is the technology integration that happens upstream, and then the technology adoption. Uh, so I get the data science area of practice for Wesco. Um, it's a B2B supply chain and logistics company. Um, so from a technology integration perspective, I can say that we are a 120 year old company, sit on 20 plus ERPs, including all kind of IoT. Right? So that's an integration challenge up front. How are you going to plan for it? So I would say the solution that we are taking along with what I see in the industry is like take that phased approach. You know, like look at your top line and bottom line. Like look at you know, like if you want, don't tap into all those 20 plus ERPs at the same time and try to get it into your data lake house or whatnot, right? So take that phased approach, work with the business team to define what those KPIs are and then work backward from there. So that's one thing. From technology adoption side, I uh, agree uh, with what you said. The challenge though is that we can adopt the technology internally, but then how do you drive that adoption with the business? Especially for a company like us, we are huge in operations. So a lot of our internal employees are group of workers, frontline employees uh, who or day in and day out in our warehouses. So if you are going to, uh, you know, come up with a process of automation or any efficiency improvement using technology, you need to know your customer. And in this case, if your customer is your internal employee, and if they happen to be working in operations, you need to talk to them, understand what their pain points are, and then fit the right uh, size technology solution to write that option. So I think both the integration and writing the option are key. 
Is that process keeping the Excel away or it's still the same? Is it, is it the piece which is like keeping the Excel survey because usually business for all the kind of technologies which are coming up, we keep asking for it. Is it like something which is happening or these processes like moving it from the Excel to the Well, you mean like uh, Excel as in the, yeah, yes. So that's a really good question. Uh, my team, what we do is we look at both predictive and generative AI. So from, uh, say, the bread and butter of our company is uh, sales and supply chain, right, which is directly related to driving growth from a top line perspective and reduce the cost, cost uh, from the bottom line perspective. Most of the work that we do in the predictive AI is say like inventory forecasting or sales forecasting. And most of the forecasting is still done using Excel spreadsheet. So the big challenge is how do you get a salesperson or how do you get somebody who's making the sales for the company to go from say using a three month moving average for a key customer to do something slightly smarter than that. You don't need a generative AI for that, but you know that you need to understand the data patterns from the customer, especially for your key customer accounts, and be able to make that change. So think about that incremental change. If you go to them with, say, hey, I have a Gen AI that can solve the problem, they're completely going to close the door for you. But then you have to work in that incremental approach to move from an Excel spreadsheet, maybe slightly smarter descriptive statistics, probably. Moving on. Uh, but so it's more of a second of the season. Bar for production quality as well as like process efficiency. How do you think about technology for like new kind of uh, market trends are like not Sure, I think quality, irrespective of whatever industry, is top notch. Right, and you need to be hundred percent there. Um, you know, the industry that I represent has a lot of semiconductor manufacturing in upfront. Uh, before I get into an answer, just to give a little bit of information about what I mean by that and the complexity. Uh, a semiconductor wafer that we manufacture is as thick as one four size of a human hair, right? And uh, uh, it goes through about 1700 process steps. Uh, it means in a facility, it probably travels about 60 kilometers in its production uh, because it takes about five to six months to, to build a wafer. Uh, and it involves probably 30 or 36 elements of periodic data. You know, so that, that how complex it is. Uh, because it goes through process like uh, milling, you know, Lithography and so on and so on, so on, so on stuff. Now, I mean, what quality is because you have to make sure that at every stage you're doing a lot of inline, you know, inspection. Uh, because at the end of the day, what we have seen is that we have sh the shift is now moving towards more from a statistical process control to more of advanced process control. That means you bring like virtual metrology kind of concept where you're able to measure certain parameters of a wafer virtually rather than doing a physical measurement so that you predict it much advanced um, or much ahead of the time. And uh, you also bring in a lot of computer visions and vision analytics to determine if those anomalies still exist or not. So I think primarily from a quality perspective we've seen that um, it's it's on the anomaly detections. Uh, it also in terms of a lot of parametric information or sensor data that comes out of your devices. Uh, or even the IoT devices that you're talking about. Now you go through the multiple blocks because they have tremendous amount of data and you don't know what are the reasons for failures. Uh, for example, when we manufacture a drive, a uh, data drive, it goes to Amazon, let's say. They're not giving us uh, any logs because of failure, right? We have to go back to our process and figure out and read through the logs to determine how that particular anomaly occurred. So that is where the shift is happening more than asking from the customer, you are deploying all such tools to predict much higher of the game. So that's a shift that I'm seeing from a of course from something that you And this is like you know your automotives is where like, we are seeing a lot more of innovation that makes us as we know this uh, industry of like implement innovations. Just wanted to understand your perspective in terms of what is the role that the entities are playing there, how we are how we are doing your newer trends and innovation within your operations. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, today if you look at uh, automotive uh, or manufacturing, almost uh, innovation and transformation are two different things, and we shouldn't get confused with that. And both are equally important. And uh, as far as innovation is concerned, if you look at it, you know, for that matter, for not just necessarily automotive GCC, for any GCCs in India, uh, 
um, 60 percent of the global digital transformations or the AI and innovations are driven from India. I think that is a number which is published everywhere. And uh, if you look at global GCCs, they've invested almost uh, two, three billion dollars in the last couple of years in the startup ecosystem in India. I think uh, we are uniquely positioned because of our uh, proximity, being a startup capital of the world and uh, academia. Um, and most of the GCCs coming up with their own accelerator programs, encouraging innovation. For example, in my organization for the engineering team, we give 20% time dedicated on innovation. So they can, they're free to do anything they want to innovate on. As a result of that, that drives the very high payment filings, um, which can be commercialized. So innovation comes in many forms and globally we believe in a open AI, uh, open innovation uh, culture um, where we collaborate with academia, startups and all of that as well. So for us, uh, I think uh, the most important and crucial uh, component was from the GCC lens, right? The GCC will thrive if they have a proximity to first markets, second, your factories. That's, that's where the entire game goes. So if you see our location, right? Mexico, we have a large factory cluster, about 17 factories are there. We have got a half there, which is completely industrial. Then we have got a large factory cluster in China. We have got China and we have factory in India, plus India is also an emerging market. So we have a, and from the tech landscape perspective, being the, the go to place right now. So we have a largest business in India. So that gives us the real uh, collaboration um, with both of the uh, both sides of the stories. The other thing what we uh, thrive upon is uh, I think the right culture is also needed. Innovation. The culture uh, which gives you the ideation and the free space to experiment, fail, move fast. So we were very clear from day one uh, when it comes to the entire ideation, innovation process. We a big, you know, uh, has to play a big role in the entire exploration. Because if you see technically uh, the foundation of GCC should be culture, rest everything. Otherwise, you are not running a, a true GCC, you are running a, a offshore center, very traditional old school style. If I can just add, right, um, innovation is not going to be, uh, you know, a lot of people do that, a lot of innovations, but the point is, how do you operationalize the innovation? How do you implement it after that? That's why I think GCCs have a very strong hold. Right, because it's not just coming up with an idea, but how do you take the idea and implement it, see through it and commercialize it and ensure that the benefit is realized. Because proving an idea could be uh, a point of time, but how do you operationalize it? I think that's where GCCs really play a major role. Yes. So it's more set up a culture and like figure out the ecosystem that it can be. So coming back to Bharat, now I want to understand a little bit more, again with manufacturing, it's more about cost management. How do you trade some of these initiatives, how do you manage your cost, cost reduction initiatives, what's your point? Sure, um, from cost perspective, if you look at the, you know, the life cycle of the whole process, uh, from our industry point of view, you know, with, with GCC here, you know, that's what dominantly this team works on, is uh, almost 20 to 25% of our manufacturing cost goes in testing. Uh, so testing because yes, getting products which uh, goes and saves memory uh, or data into those memory devices. So a test time reduction is one of the critical uh, key parameter for us, and we try to reduce the cost for that. Uh, second is uh, as I mentioned, like we have a pretty long haul of manufacturing the semiconductor. So uh, any failure or any anomalies that you get has significant impact on the. Uh, you know, scrap as well as the rework. So that is something we uh, address in a lot of other solutions to manage that. Um, and uh, then comes into how do you really make sure that there's an optimization that you bring in the process. For example, 
uh, use operation research um, and you know apply that techniques to make sure that you are you know you are you are actually doing a lot of optimizations within the scheduling or mind scheduling in the back end process of it, right? So that's why we save a lot of money. Uh, then we also use a lot of digital brain technologies, which we call as uh, discrete simulation simulations, which is Let's say if I want to deposit the robots onto the factory, uh, I don't know how many robots are required, I don't know whether they will give me the throughput that I need, uh, I want to make sure they don't collide, they take a critical path to transfer the material, and they go to the charging station in between, right? But there are many scenarios that you want to try out, so that's why we're doing digital twin solutions to simulate all those things before we do the capital expenditure. So all these initiatives that we run here gives us significant cost reductions. From your perspective? Yeah, um, I can add to that. So we, uh, I would say, you know, look at your key business process cycles. Like being a supply chain company, I can say there are three that comes to my mind. First is, you know, a company like us who are orchestrators of goods, basically, who has a network of suppliers and then a network of customers we serve uh, from the suppliers through us. There's a lot of document processing involved there be it for processing purchase orders or invoices, responding to RFQ, it could be NDA, new customer supplier onboarding, there's tons of documents. You sit on pressure flow of document there. And a lot of times these go from the ingestion, like from the actual source when it starts to an order form or to some kind of an order entry where it sits in the database. And traditionally it was managed by a combination of RPA bots and most of the data entry portions were very bad. So when we drilled down to the weeds of that, we found that you, know, you can achieve speed to value by getting more advanced analytics, AI, and even your experience and generating techniques to realize that speed to value as a part of that automation workflow. The second and the third one, very closely related in the supply chain world, is order to cash and procure to pay. This is again, you know, like very standard in a lot of companies where you get a PO from a customer and then you kind of go back and forth between your planners, buyers, inventory, operations team to the supplier and eventually after when the good gets, goods get shipped to the customer. So in that, and, and you get paid, so your accounts payable or like in this case accounts receivable is the last, is the end member. So in that order to cash cycle, drill down to the weeds and see what are the components that everybody can orchestrate this process faster. There is change management involved, there is a lot of handover involved. So we are exploring something like the multi-agent LLM framework where the LLMs can actually orchestrate that. Now I would say in the spirit of innovation, it's still more of a research phase. When, it, when we are able to commercialize and monetize, I'll come back here and talk more about it. Same thing goes to the procure to pay, like very similar to the order to cash. But my point is look at these process workflows and then automation. So I'm sprinkling more or throw more intelligence within that automation. So that would mean simulate, execute, automate, and optimize. That's what I think it would I mean, as long as it doesn't stay as intellectual curiosity exercise, it's a man. You know, it's how you bring it to adoption. Yeah. And coming back, so again, one of the things which has been like, you know, common with like, GCC is that, like, you know, how do you culturally collaborate with like non social stakeholders, both job reviews as well as the functions. That has been one of the larger challenges stated by like most of the things. What is your best practices there? What is your learnings there? Or success there? Yeah, I mean not that we had a very smooth journey. We also had our own fair share of challenges. See the way you work as a as a global GCC right? Uh, it all connects and collaboration um, with different stakeholders is like very crucial for success. Otherwise, you are just a cost center where you are hiring people to do a certain task and you are saving costs. But I think uh, what we work well for us is first thing, uh, craft the journey. You may not do it on day one, right? Uh, but have a big picture. How do you uh, drive uh, that 50-50 planning, ownership and accountability and uh, then look for the creative tools like two in one leadership box. Right? So example, uh, a cyber leader in the US and cyber leader in India driving the entire cyber charter and after a year or three they get mixed into one. 
things now. So that's how you do the shift more strategically. So that helps you to understand the culture, the local nuances. You know. Plus, um, gone the days where like you know, headquarters, headquarters, and nothing else beyond that, right? So that that myth is going and fitting in this story. Um, NASCOM published a recent report. I hope that comes out to be true. Uh, Thirty thousand global roads uh, will be shipped to India by 2030. That's a massive. Uh, but if you ask me how much we are doing, I think we already have five to seven roles in pipeline, which are global roles, which we are going to India to drive the, the transformation. So I think the, the shift is changing. You do the right mix of uh, your location, your location and your hub persona, or sorry, DC persona should be well thought and also well linked into your strategy papers. So that gives you a, a good email. Can you say that tough patience? Do the markets have patience for this? No. Even as a human being, we don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> right? But uh, see, when say patience, uh, because see, it's a very sensitive topic. Right? Uh, when you do a left and shift, traditionally, uh, many GCCs have gone there. Right? But if you are a cultural practitioner, you know how to, you know, what to execute when. Well, and how to create that basic playground before you start working. So I think uh, that lift and shift won't work because today, one side you are saying you are a global company, you all are saying, and second side you are running these kind of programs, it doesn't work. So it's a contradiction. So as a, as a cultural leader, uh, because the GCC leader has to be uh, full savvy about the cultural things. So that's where I see the, the Patients are even coming to this. I think being in many global roles, I can definitely share uh, that you know the first thing we need to break is the us versus them. Right? It is no longer that GCC is given a certain task to execute and GCC is executing. I think those days are gone away, you know, and uh, us. Uh, it's about understanding the business context, understanding the business priorities, uh, setting up a common goal. Uh, between the teams together and understanding and how to be um, collectively collaborate and achieve that success for the organization. As long as you and I have the same goals, it's easier uh, rather than driving two different uh, things. It's been a great perspective. Thanks for that. Thank you.